In this video, we will see how to evaluate the discrete time Fourier transform from the Z-transform. We're going to start with our transfer function defined as a ratio of polynomials in the variable Z, where we have each of the poles and zeros clearly shown as follows. We can therefore see how the entire transfer function H of Z is characterized by its zeros and its poles. Furthermore, we can look at the poles and zeros in the z-plane, as shown here. And this is the same as we saw in the video on the z-transform poles and zeros. And we have this associated region of convergence defined by the poles. Here we have the equation formulation of the z-transform where we can see how it's related to the discrete time Fourier transform of h of n by first pre-multiplying by r to the minus n. Well, similarly to the Laplace transform, we can actually see something interesting here. We can find the Fourier transform of h of n itself if r is equal to 1. In other words, evaluating the discrete time Fourier transform of h of n is equivalent to evaluating the z transform on the unit circle. Whereas with the Laplace transform, we evaluate it along the j omega axis to find the continuous time Fourier transform using the Laplace transform, here we're going to use the unit circle. This means that the unit circle must be in the transfer function's region of convergence in order for this to make any sense, otherwise this won't converge. So this can furthermore be written as h of z evaluated at z equals e to the j omega, since we set r equal to 1 and z is equal to r e to the j omega. Using this, we can define the magnitude and the phase of the discrete time Fourier transform as shown here. Since we can simply plug in e to the j omega instead of z in our transfer function in most cases. And we can see that the magnitude and phase are defined very similarly to how they were in the Laplace transform. We can also show what this means in the z domain, in the z plane, by looking at a simple example where let's say we have a zero at the origin and a pole on the real axis here. We're going to evaluate things on the unit circle in order to get the Fourier transform, so we'll draw that over here, that's the unit circle. And if we want to evaluate for a particular value of omega, well, that's going to be, for example, here, where this is going to be e to the j, and let's say that this is 1 radian per second, so this is at 1. Then we're going to, just like in the Laplace domain, we're going to draw vectors, because that's what this is defining, e to the j omega minus each 0 minus each pole, that corresponds to a vector, and again, we're just going to look at their magnitudes, m1 and m2, and at their angles, phi1 and phi2. So the magnitude of h of e to the j1 is equal to m1 over m2, and the phase of h of e to the j1 is equal to phi1 minus phi2 according to this equation here. And to evaluate the entire discrete time Fourier transform, we will go all the way around this circle. And recall that the discrete time Fourier transform has a 2 pi periodicity, which makes sense in this context, since we're going to repeat the same exact values after every 2 pi, since that's a full time around the circle. Now we're going to look at a particular example in MATLAB. Specifically, the transfer function will be defined as follows, where we have two zeros, one at zero and one at negative one-half, and two complex conjugate poles. So in this illustration, we can see how the discrete time Fourier transform is getting computed. We see these vectors that we have drawn traveling along the unit circle, and the magnitude and phase of the Fourier transform getting traced out as those ratios and differences that we had talked about in magnitude and phase. And you can see that we've only plotted between negative pi and pi in frequency, 
because the whole function is going to be 2 pi periodic. So altogether, we have seen how to evaluate the discrete time Fourier transform from the Z transform as well as the physical meaning of this operation.